pure and simple. People who are doing drugs are breaking the law, and we have to put them away for as long as we can. And this is the main way we can address America's drug crisis. There is a massive expansion in America's prison system over the course of the 1980s. The percentage of Americans in prison triples between 1980 and 2005. And they are building these prisons as quickly as they can across the country. They still can't keep up with the growing demand for this space they need to lock up all of these drug offenders. And this actually has huge consequences, which you guys are still living with today. For one thing, we still argue about this war on drugs. Was it the right thing to do? Did we do it the right way? Could we have done this differently? And what do we do about it today? It's a question with no easy answers. After all, you know, you, uh, uh, you have a lot of people who say you don't want these drugs just flowing freely, especially with so many children around. But you also don't want, uh, you also have this prison population which is so overcrowded, it's become a huge drain on national resources on budgets and on law enforcement, etc. And you have this major debate in American society today. What do you do about this incarceration rate? Is there anything, is there any good solution we can come up with for this? And meanwhile, uh, has America's drug problems gone away? No. And what they have found is that no matter how many people you lock up for drug-related offenses, there's still just this drug epidemic which is gripping the country on an almost continual basis. This is where I'll open up the, dis the discussion a little bit, by the way. What do you guys think? Do you have any ideas why we can't find a way out of this? Yeah. I found that when I was in college, and when I first got to college in the uh, late 60s, yeah. The only thing available really was weed. Uh -huh. And as soon as Nixon jumped on it and made, all of a sudden you could get anything. Heroin, you could get anything on campus. As oh, wow. As soon as they started cracking down <laughs> yeah. on, the, like, on the psychedelic stuff, people's there was pills, there was heroin, there was everything. So you yeah. believe that the, the, the epidemics got worse with the crackdowns, basically? And absolutely, yeah. Yeah? Anyone else have any thoughts on this particular topic? Yes. As they became more illegal, mm -hmm. the prices went up, so mm -hmm. it became a bigger market. And that's a good point, actually. Uh, and by the way, it's really hard to get reliable statistics on this, but some economics experts believe that drugs today uh, are like the, the number 10 component of the entire global economy or something like that. They are this trillion dollar global industry which connects us to these different countries all over the world. This is a massive market. Uh, you once again can connect this back to Afghanistan. In the chaos of Afghanistan, there was an explosion of opium production because that was one of the only ways in Afghanistan anyone could make any money. And this further flooded the global market with this opium, which we're still living with the consequences of. So definitely this massive market and this belief amongst people, this is the only way you can turn a good profit. You could definitely argue that this is another reason why this is a problem we just struggle so much with. <coughs> So, any other uh, questions? Yeah. I heard um, that in Vietnam there was um, drugs released by our covert going into Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And it was released in um, New York. Mm -hmm. Oh. And so they got a lot of very pure um, heroin. And mm -hmm. a lot of people died. Yes. And actually, you, there's a big but, but growth in drug use in the 1960s, by the way, in general. But some of it is connected to the Vietnam War. Many soldiers over in Vietnam, you know, all these drugs are widely available in that area. They're living through the horrors of the war. Many of them are becoming hooked on various substances in an effort to deal with them. 
which is something which we're still familiar with as a society today. You know, we still have a lot of veterans who have these different, uh, uh, you know, struggles trying to adjust back into society, and you have sometimes them falling into substance abuse issues, alcoholism, uh, other substance abuse issues. So definitely. There's also a connection people have made between living through Vietnam and this other flood of new drugs that are coming into the country. Yes, sir? I'm kind of curious how we characterize drugs and alcohol when alcohol has such deleterious effects on people's personality and domestic violence and car accidents and on and on and on, and yet we say, well, that's just you know, drinking, but these drugs, wow, they're really evil. I mean, you never find a, a, a fight at a, at, a, at a pot party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you, know, you just don't get in anybody's face, that's all. Yeah. yeah. We could debate. <laughs> we, could, we could debate how to classify drugs until the cows come home, but you are totally. You're, there are a lot of people who feel the exact same way. I read this article, uh, you know, just about a week ago or so. There was a group of scientists who were asked, how would you group drugs in order of basically uh, how dangerous they are to society? They grouped alcohol up there with heroin. Like, they considered it one of the most dangerous drugs for society. Uh, and so we still debate today, what drug should you classify as dangerous and what drug should you not? Alas... I will leave that to you guys to debate amongst yourselves. But this national anti-drug crusade in the 1980s, it's to some extent, uh, and this is another uh, interesting uh, analysis here, it's to some extent fueled by this media craze. They actually conducted, you know, you can gather like every mention of drugs in the media of this time. What are the newspapers saying about it? What are the magazines saying about it? A lot of this stuff has been preserved in microfilm. And these political scientists have said, if you look at the year 1986, for instance, which is when this issue got a lot of coverage, they mentioned something like the Iraq-Iran war overseas, something like that. They mentioned that a total of 230 times in the national press. They mentioned this 2,800 times. This was an issue which was just consuming the national attention in the 1980s to the extent that uh, some of the big media owners actually admitted a couple years later, you know, we might have blown that up a little bit just because people loved the headlines, people loved reading and talking about this national drug crisis. But there were some other more famous silly campaigns that came out of this. For instance, does anyone remember how the First Lady of the United States... Oh, say no. Just, say, just no. say no! Yes, the, the famous Just Say No campaign, which they really sold like crazy in American schools. I think she appeared on a famous 80s TV show and said that, actually. It was Saved by the Bell or Fed Family Time, something like that. So she actually... Uh, made this national effort to try to convince children to just say no to drugs. Many people felt that the national efforts at this time were not particularly effective. So, any uh, questions or thoughts up to this point? No? Well, um, okay. Now, yeah, let's really, let's really get to the fun stuff now. Well, first of all, um, there's... 80s fashion and 80s music and stuff, and uh, I personally don't get it. Like, I, I have, you yeah, know, I, I know all these people who look back on, like, people in the 80s and say, oh my god, that was the greatest music of all time. Uh, that was, you know, uh, the greatest time period for fashion and hairstyles and stuff. I am a history teacher, and uh, I look back on every decade in American history, how they were dressing, how uh, the you know what they were listening to, etc. I kind of sort of get every decade but the 1980s. I I, I I just don't quite get what what they were trying to accomplish here. But oh, does anyone who was alive in the 80s want to you know explain it or no? You think it looked good? Yeah. It was some people's vote. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you felt that uh, what better way to stick it to like, you know, uh, the older, more traditional generations than dressing with as bright colors and poofy hair as you possibly can? Yeah. Okay, but you know what? This is 
is exercise gear. And I have to tell you, you didn't, when you were born before this time, yeah. exercise was not part of your normal routine. True. Exercise That's does not. That's a good thing. Yes. Yeah. That's a good point. Exercise does not catch on as an astral phenomenon until the 1970s. Like, when people, when the first joggers come around, people are like, you just run? Like, what, what, what's, what exactly is the point of that, you know? So, yeah, I mean, uh, you're right. There is this new exercise fad in the 1980s. Uh, does anyone know? Yes? Well, I just wanted to say, also, there was a new flash dance that came out. True. Flash dance, <laughs> yep. Part of it, too. The glamorization of dance, but also everybody was dancing in the clubs and everything. That was a big part of it. And true, yes. Music phenomenon. So I think the dress matches the music. Yes, and that's quite true. And there's a major dance phenomenon in the 1980s. Uh, you guys are well aware of this. There's entire films made about this dance phenomenon. Flash dance. Uh, there was a film all about uh, the uh, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, the break, the, the breaking, or something. You know, like uh, uh, all these different types of dances. So you definitely have this national dance craze in the 1980s. But another good thing to point about 1980s fashion. Um, it really matches this new culture of consumption and this culture this idea just go out and enjoy yourself and have fun go out there and you know dress uh, flamboyantly and listen to this music which you know it's not the let's change the world music of the 1960s it's way more and we'll listen to a bit of it in a second by the way but you know it's way more synthesizer driven beat driven uh you know you have the hair metal bands that are all about just going out and partying these different musical styles sold millions of albums in the 1980s, and they perfectly captured the let's enjoy ourselves attitude of this new generation coming of age in the 80s. Yeah. So radio stations are divided by decades. Yes. You know, the yes, they are. Music they still are. Music, yes. Et cetera. I read somewhere that the music that you listen to your whole life mm -hmm. is the music you enjoy between the ages of 18 and 25. It's. And that's because uh, that's the music you emotionally connect with the most in your life. Okay. That's kind of when you're most emotionally vulnerable. So yes. Baby boom. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember exactly when that was, but it's, it seems to me there's a big bubble of the population that was between 18 and 25 uh -huh. in the 80s. Um, yes. So that would carry through. The tail end of the baby boom is growing up in the 1980s. Uh, and, uh, of course, the beginning of the baby boom is all about those oldies, you know, which still, you still hear everywhere in American culture. But the tail end of the baby boom, they're born in the early 60s. So they're coming of age in the 1980s. And, by the way, that's one of the reasons why you see a conservative political shift in this generation. They watch their parents go out there and fight to civil rights and environmental feminism change the world. When they're growing up in the bad economic times of the early 80s, they're way more worried about, you know what, I need to be able to afford a house. I need to be able to afford a car and a suburban lifestyle. I want to be able to put my kids through college. These financial motives are way more important to them than the declining causes of the 60s and 70s. That's another reason why you see this major conservative political shift in this generation. Go ahead for a second. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm watching you talk about all this. I'm just wondering if you could speak to the uh, type of feminism. That I am getting to that. I will. Yes, good question. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about it. It seems kind of uh, the second coming of the 1920s and the lifestyle and how uh, it was defined by its clothing and a whole new music came about with synth synthesizers and how jazz defined the 20s and synthesizers defined the 80s. Yes. And Glenn over there is a good student in my history class. He is directly making connections between uh, the 1920s and this culture of the 1980s. You can definitely make some connections here. Yes. Huh? Greed, yes. Oh, and the whole greed is good thing. Yes. Uh, oh, by the way, what famous 80s character said greed is good? Gordon Gekko of the movie Wall Street. Yes. This greed is good philosophy. Uh, it really fits with this new economic philosophy that the wealthy people of America are the economic backbone of America. You see this new belief, it's okay to go out there and make a ton of money and spend it on yourself because that is what the American economy is all about. Now, uh, I, I'm going to start to get to this at the end of this lecture. There are some serious problems we run into at the end of the 1980s 
that first start to jolt some of people's perceptions about these values. But definitely, though, you can make all these connections in 80s culture. Yes? No, I was just going to say that probably the colors come from um, how we, you know, like the first computers and the first video games and like everything else that. There is a technological revolution of sorts in the 80s. But, okay, guys, I can tell you want to move on to other topics because you keep on bringing up stuff I'm going to talk about in the lecture. So, yeah, so we'll go ahead and we'll, and we'll keep going here. But I also wanted to mention, and Christina mentioned this, there was a major debate over what is the status of feminism in the 1980s because clearly its peak moment in the 60s, early 70s has come and gone. They won what they see as major achievements, uh, the uh, uh, national access to birth control, better sexual harassment protections in the workplace, better access to daycare, etc. But you also have this massive conservative backlash against these gains of feminism. Many Americans, more traditionally valued type of Americans, they felt that, this, uh, that these achievements of feminism were a major step in the wrong direction, that they were undermining what they felt were traditional gender roles in American society. By the way, another thing we never stop arguing over. To what extent are any differences between men and women natural, and to what extent are they differences foisted upon us uh, by society? That is one of the dividing lines you see in these liberal and conservative interpretations of feminism, to what extent do you believe that these gender divisions are natural or are arbitrarily imposed? So feminism is in this curious state in the 1980s. On the one hand, you have the massive conservative political way. The huge anti-abortion movement is really in its peak form in the 1980s. They are doing these massive protests all across the country. And you see uh, these conservative activists, evangelical preachers, arguing that what, that what we need is a total shift back in the direction of more conservative gender values. At the same time, more and more women are going to work in the 1980s. These, there's this growing opportunity in workplaces across America for women in the 1980s. You also see this growing, uh, this growing belief that things like sexual harassment, which had long been accepted in American society, are not okay. So women are in this interesting transitional phase in the 1980s as they're kind of debating amongst themselves what is the next logical step for American women. And this is where we're going to have some fun here. And actually, I'm going to have to get over here and exit out of my slideshow for a second here. There was one female icon in the 80s whom people could not stop arguing about in terms of is she good or bad for American women. This was an American singer of Italian-American ancestry named Louise Cicerone. Some of, you may, some of you may know her by another name. So let's go ahead and watch a video of this famous 80s icon. Then I'll tell you a little bit about these debates that people were having about her. By the way, not only do you have these uh, uh, different uh, debates over feminism with Madonna here, you also have a lot of commentary on 80s culture here. So let's...
dissertations oh written in the 80s and 90s as to whether or not Madonna was a good or bad thing for women. But uh, did you guys have any questions or thoughts about what you saw in the Madonna video right here? I mean, what was Madonna, what was her message in this video right here? She's like, I can have anyone I want. I can have anyone I want. Yep. Money was everything. Money was everything, yes. And in what way, I mean, doesn't this sound like a good song for the 80s here? We're living in a material world, and I am a material girl. Yes, and it's funny, like, as I said, there have been essays, like, dissecting this video. To some extent, they, you know, there's criticism. She's just reveling in this culture of empty materialism and sexuality. By the way, some Madonna videos are way more sensual than that. Than that. <laughs> On the other hand... You also have the fact that she's kind of powerfully asserting herself and she's clearly like having some dominance over these other men around her. So we have all of these debates to this day about female stars such as Madonna. So if uh, that's not a great fun symbol about the confusing uh, status of feminism in the 80s, I don't know what is. So any other questions or thoughts about Madonna videos or anything like that? She can stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. One's on Lake Road, totally back. <laughs> oh, okay, so, yes, and uh, you're absolutely right, by the way. 80s fashion is totally coming back in a lot of circles. So, yeah, any other questions or thoughts? Okay. And then there's stuff like this going on. Uh, you guys were asking me a little bit about the technological revolution of the 80s. The 80s are the beginning of the technological world that we live in today. The home computer had been around uh, to some extent since the end of the 60s, but it's really in the 1980s that the concept of the home computer really starts to take off. Taking this computer technology, which previously had only been available to the wealthiest people, the biggest officials, military bases, and making this stuff available for the general public. In fact, there's a technology that is invented on military bases in the 80s, which is designed to help them just trade this information back and forth of these bases all over the world. Eventually, that's going to make its way to home computers in the 90s. Anyone know what that will be? Yes, the internet. The 80s is not quite the age of the internet, but it's definitely the age of the home computer. It's the age of the video game. Some of you may remember the first ever Nintendo system, which begins the era of home video gaming, which anyone who has young kids today know, knows what that's all about. That all begins when, that all begins when uh, the, 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 uh, Japan begins to market this in the United States at the end of the 1980s. Then you have this little guy right here, and this also totally changes technology. What's this guy right here? Yeah, the VCRs. Now, with the VCRs, you get this growing concept of home viewing. By the way, it's kind of funny. You, might, you can make whatever connections you want to modern society today as well. Movie studios freaked out when they started selling the first, the first VCRs. They said, this is going to kill us. This is going to bankrupt the box office. Yes? That's kind of like now we have Netflix, and everyone's like, oh my god, Netflix, like you can watch anything. The internet, the piracy of the 2000s, you know, home video on demand today, 
Yeah, the movie studios are still saying this stuff's gonna kill us so far, they're still functioning. But yes, with the VCR, suddenly, uh, you know, at the beginning of the 80s, almost no one has these. By the end of the 80s, everyone has these. You get this new technology where people can grab tapes or they can record them themselves and they can watch the movies they love over and over again. This allows for the further growth of pop culture. And it allows for new massive marketing campaigns by the studio. So, prior to the 1980s, the concept of a movie franchise was a relatively alien concept. The first major sequel of the 1980s is The Empire Strikes Back in 1980. The Star Wars generation and the Star Trek generation, this new generation of obsession with pop culture, 